Lana Hogarth is Associate Professor of History at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on the medical and scientific constructions of race during the era of slavery and beyond. Her first book, Medicalizing Blackness, Making Racial Difference in the Atlantic World, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2017. Her lecture, Measuring Miscegenation, Eugenics and the Legacy of Slavery, shows how myths about mixed race people, which originated in the slave societies of the United States and the Atlantic world, continually fueled the work of Charles Davenport and other eugenicists. Professor Hogarth's lecture is part of a wider project explaining how mixed race people with black and white ancestry became targeted by eugenicists for study in the early decades of the 20th century. Many thanks for inviting me to share my work with you today. Uh, before I get started, I would like to offer a content warning for the audience. Uh, in my presentation, the terms Negro, racial hybrid, miscegenation, and mulatto will appear. And I use these terms to stay in keeping with the terminology of the historical context that I study. I do not assume that anyone whom eugenicists categorize as a Negro or mulatto person or hybrid exists today. And my use of these terms is in no way an endorsement. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about miscegenation and eugenics. Mixed race people of white and African descent elicited a shared discomfort in white American commentators who saw them as an unnatural product of an unspoken but much carried on transgression namely interracial sex. In the United States, where legal and social prescriptions against black and white sexual and marital relations were the norm, the persistence of so-called mulattoes, that is, people who had one black parent and one white parent, implied that interracial sex was a feature and not an aberration of American society. And this is particularly true if we consider how slavery created the material conditions that led to sex between these two races. And this concern over race mixing obviously did not escape the gaze of eugenicists. So if we think a little bit about racial intermixture, we might turn to the work of Peggy Pasco, who astutely observed um, about the politics of interracial relations in the United States, quote, white men could and did debauch black women with little or no fear of prosecution because laws against interracial marriage merely helped them hide their abuse of black women and escape economic responsibility for the children they fathered, end quote. So mixed race people with black and white ancestry, the group to which I'm confining my research, were not really unique. And from the era of slavery onward, we can see that their bodies endured scrutiny and speculation. They indeed became objectified and discussed and described with curiosity, desire, and revulsion by those concerned about the future of racial fitness and purity across the Americas. Um, and this was most certainly the case with eugenics. That said, most histories of eugenics actually don't discuss mulattoes um, and these other kinds of racial hybrids, um, even though they became held up as symbols of racial unfitness, both mentally and physically speaking. And while there is no shortage of scholarly work on mixed race people with black and white ancestry, few of those works have been explicitly dedicated to examining how their bodies became socially constructed in the name of eugenics. So this lack of historical engagement with how eugenicists viewed the mulatto is arresting considering that there was a eugenic obsession with things like fitness. Um, we see in popular scientific lay writings obsessions with how mixed race people might appear, their physical capabilities. And in many cases, these groups of people were often referred to as problems or actual nuisances. So I wondered, um, as doing this sort of research on um, uh, race crossing studies um, and imagination, you know, why there is this lack of engagement. And I wonder if it has much to do with how we think about eugenics. Um, so in the popular imagination, eugenics is um, often talked about as this sort of outdated, terrible pseudoscience. Um, it's often clearly associated with anti-immigrant sentiments and associations with the Nazis. Um, but I think, um, as many of the other panelists a part of this symposium would argue, that what eugenics represents is something far more complex. And uh, today I'd like to actually argue for a perhaps more expansive view of eugenics 
one that actually includes uh, sort of early ideas about quantifying and measuring humans' capabilities and racial fitness. Um, and I'm thinking here of methods that are more aligned with um, anthropology and anthropometric study rather than necessarily just Mendelian genetics. So if we think to the work of uh, Daniel Kevlis, a historian and a leading scholar of eugenics, um, he's actually pointed out that roughly 20 years before coining the term eugenics, Francis Galton actually dabbled in ideas to improve um, human stock. So for example, um, we can think about um, hereditary genius, which is uh, pictured here. Um, I would actually go as far as saying that Galton um, had a clear understanding of racial fitness um, before he formally coined the term eugenics in 1883. Um, and he thought about racial fitness and unfitness as the case may be. Um, and he actually relied on uh, negative assumptions about black people um, in, in sort of these early understandings of racial fitness. So for example, um, some of these musings that appear in Hereditary Genius, um, this is the 1869 edition, um, we see Galton grappling with ideas of um, the origin of natural ability. And Galton contemplated the intellectual capabilities of non whites So he actually theorized that, quote, Negro intelligence was on average two grades below that of the English and evidently not a sign of, quote, good stock. Uh, this assessment reveals where Galton drew his information. He writes, quote, the number among the Negroes of whom we shall call half-witted men is very large, wrote Galton. Every book alluding to Negro servants in America is full of instances. I was myself much impressed by this fact during my travels in Africa, end quote. So here we see this ineptitude of the race um, being sort of a foregone conclusion for Galton um, and something that he ascertains through data that he um, amassed from the distinct geography that people resided. Um, and, and I would also say that we see in Galton uh, a figure, at least in his writings, someone who's willing to collapse this idea of fitness, um, mental and physical, into a feature of somebody's race. Um, and I believe that Galton is talking about race in terms of an element of one's biology. And if we think to um, what historian Maria Serta, who again is another scholar I imagine you'll be hearing from during the symposium, um, Serta has noted that of Galton's writings, he didn't necessarily define the word race, but he did use the word race quite frequently. And it seems that Galton understood that to be sort of something biological. Um, as Turda notes, quote, as a community of people sharing similar physiological and psychological characteristics transmitted from generation to generation, end quote. So essentially, Galton is, is someone who sees fitness or unfitness, something that takes place along racial lines. So employing a, a very broad view of eugenics, as I mentioned earlier, means that we can start to think about how non-white people, and in my case, mixed race people with black and white ancestry, became targeted by those who have this interest in racial fitness. And beyond that, we can consider how this group of people um, were subject to comments about mental capabilities well before the advent of eugenics. Um, and I think we might want to consider the long history of medical and scientific assessments of mixed race people, um, and particularly think about written commentary on mixed race people that emerged in the era of slavery, which kind of shows this, this very long preoccupation um, with ideas about their bodies and what they can do and cannot do. And thus, I want us to think about how slavery and its aftermath actually shaped eugenic era research questions, some of the assumptions and expectations and approaches to assessing racial fitness um, that we see in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, and we see a lot of this actually in the work of Charles Davenport, um, a figure who I will talk about in just a moment. But I also think, um, you know, as we reframe, you know, eugenics and think about the targets of the eugenic gaze, we want to really look deep into the history, like sort of going into maybe the middle of the 19th century, if you will. So I offer you um, this image here, which is um, the U.S. Sanitary Commission study of uh, black and white soldiers. This is um, Investigations of the Military and Anthropological Statistics of American Soldiers, published in 1869. And, and here we see a very concrete example um, of a study that relies on anthropometry uh, to sort of gauge the fitness, the strength, the endurance, the vitality of troops. And because this is uh, taking place with the Civil War era and the aftermath, there is access to black, white, and mixed race men's bodies. 
And what we find is that this study actually ends up being a kind of clearinghouse on, on data on the fitness of some of these men. Um, and so I should say here that anthropometry is, is a way of sort of measuring physical human variation. Um, and this actually becomes quite essential for assessing racial fitness. It's used by anthropologists and it's most certainly used by eugenicists. Um, and this effort, um, I should add, at least for the um, U.S. Sanitary Commission, is actually led by Benjamin A. Gould, um, who perhaps people know of as a well-known astronomer. But I should say that historians such as Margaret Humphreys, Lundy Braun, and Leslie Schwong, um, and others have also shown how this particular study um, solidified views about Black and mulatto inferiority. Um, and I would also say that Gould's approach, right, so his process for studying and standardizing measurement of men um, actually ends up being quite um, influential. So you can see here on the early paper from Charles Davenport, um, he, again, this leading um, American eugenicist, he sort of notes uh, the utility of what Gould does um, in sort of measuring soldiers at the end of the Civil War. And he sort of says that this is one of, you know, the first really um, well done large scale efforts um, of measuring variation in men from across sort of uh, the United States. So here we can think about the Civil War, uh, right? Of writings emerging out of the Civil War that helped to solidify anthropometry and anthropology as means of assessing racial fitness um, and, and sort of reading fitness through the body's proportions. So I would like to go just a little step further, if you will. And I want to say that, okay, this is sort of Civil War era. I think we could step back even further and think about the era of slavery and um, its legacies um, in laying the foundations for the kind of research questions and assumptions eugenicists employed. So as I mentioned, uh, Charles Davenport is going to feature pretty um, heavily. Um, he has a number of attempts at trying to um, measure and assess uh, so-called mulattoes. And much of his attempts really bear this sort of uh, influence of, of slavery. Um, they were, mixed race people are sort of front and center in some of his um, most well-known race crossing studies. Um, so namely there's the 1913 study, Heredity of Skin Color in Negro White Crosses and his 1929 follow-up study, Race Crossing in Jamaica. Now, Davenport was not the only figure interested in mixed race people. Um, and I should also add here that African Americans um, in the early decades of the 20th century were also interested in eugenics and embraced some elements of it with respect to racial uplift. Um, and I would also add that there are cases of African Americans who did participate or conduct their own studies um, on mixed race people. So for example, um, Carolyn Bond Day, who is perhaps maybe less well known, um, was a Harvard trained um, anthropologist. So she trained at Harvard just as Charles Davenport did. Um, she actually studied under Ernest Houghton um, and she published a study of some Negro white families in the United States. Um, her study comes in, out in 1932 after Davenport's race crossing in Jamaica. But I think if we were to read these two studies together, we would actually see sort of putting them in conversation that some of what uh, Carolyn Bondé writes is a direct challenge to Charles Davenport's assessment of mixed race people. Indeed, I would argue that um, rather than showing mixed race people to be uh, intellectually stunted, which is what Davenport claims, Day actually works to um, underscore the great civic and intellectual accomplishments of mixed race people. So um, I want to sort of think a little bit about uh, Davenport and what he wanted to um, investigate in some of his studies, right? The hearsay, um, the, the, the ideas putting around mulattoes that emerged in the era of slavery that he decided to study. So he does indeed tackle the question of um, mulatto infertility, um, which we might say, well, that clearly isn't true, but Davenport felt that he needed to sort of clearly and explicitly sort of put that mythology to rest. Um, we can see that how he collects data, um, some of the expectations he has, um, some of the claims that he goes after, so again, to this point of um, infertility, um, those are things that had their origins in the era of slavery. And so based on some of the evidence that I've acquired so far, it seems to me that Davenport wanted to kind of correct and, and challenge, but also reformulate some of the wild, widely held lay and scientific beliefs about the physical and mental capabilities of mixed race people. Um, so there's really no shortage of um, you know, data when we think about you know, what were people writing about mixed race people. Um, 
And so I hope to kind of summarize a little bit here of what Davenport concluded about um, mixed race people. Um, and then I would sort of go through and walk you through um, some of the particular myths and hearsay he was interested in. So um, a, an article that really stands out that I think encapsulates some of what Davenport feels towards mixed race people um, uh, comes to us in a 1917 article where he declares that mulattoes are simply, quote, a nuisance to others, end quote. He says that these hybridized people were, quote, badly put together and ineffective, end quote. Um, and this article, I should say, actually appears in the Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society. Um, and this is just one of several publications where Davenport kind of really takes up the issue of, of mixed race people, of mulattoes in particular. Um, he continues, quote, mulattoes combine something of a white man's intelligence and ambition with an insufficient intelligence to realize that ambition, end quote. So it's, it's pretty clear that Davenport has um, very strong feelings um, against um, race crossing, against mulattoes in particular. And we clearly see that there is sort of this clear undercurrent of anti-Black racism um, that's behind much of his assessment. So I want to just turn to some of the myths that Davenport was preoccupied with um, when thinking about mixed race people. Um, so if we look back, going all the way into sort of the 1850s, we might find pro-slavery um, writings that specifically reference the weakness of, of mixed race people. So if we look at an example from the um, Memphis medical reporter, A.P. Merrill um, was a physician, pro-slavery physician who loudly complained that the mulatto was quote, less curable than white persons on account of his greater feebleness of constitution, end quote. Um, and I should add that even those who were opposed to slavery saw the mulatto as a problem. Um, so I mentioned before Benjamin A. Gould, who sort of worked for the U.S. Sanitary Commission. He was clearly a supporter of the union cause, but he remarked um, on the, quote, well-known phenomenon of mulatto's inferior vitality, end quote. Um, so I want to say a little bit about some of the sentiments, um, these uh, beliefs in the inherent flaws of the mulatto body that I think were very palpable in Davenport's later research. Um, and I would actually argue for Davenport to even bother to dig into questions of mixed race people's like um, endurance, their strength, their vitality, for me is a way of him actually participating, being a part of these projects of sort of objectifying and assessing mixed race people's bodies that had been going on for quite some time. So in some of his um, lectures and published studies on race crossing, he addressed mythologies about mulattoes that had been propagated by two um, well-known slavery era commentators. So he actually picks on two commentators from the 18th and 19th century, respectively. Um, Anglo-Jamaican planter Edward Long and Southern physician Josiah Knott. Um, and you'll see here on the image um, in front of you, this is a, just sort of a, an excerpt from Josiah Knott's 1843 um, article on mixed race uh, people. But I'll start with um, Edward Long. So writing in 1774, Edward Long complained um, that it was sort of extraordinary that two mulattoes should be unable to continue their species. The women either proving barren or their offspring, if they had, have any, not attaining maturity. The subject deserves a further and very attentive inquiry. So you'll see here, um, here's some further and attentive inquiry. Long probably would have been pleased to note that pro-slavery physician Josiah Knott heeded this call for more inquiry into the mulatto but then actually cited Edward Long as a high authority on the subject. So if you'll see here um, in this 1843 article, which is entitled, The Mulatto, a Hybrid, Probable Extermination of the Two Races if Whites and Blacks are Allowed to Intermarry, uh, Long says, East, or not, excuse me, says, Eastwick and Long, who are high authorities in their histories of Jamaica, both assert unhesitatingly that the male and female mulatto do not produce so many children together, end quote. So here is sort of, I, I like to think of this as sort of that, that citation, that paper trail, where we have somebody like Edward Long complaining in the 18th century about mulattoes. And then you have in the 1840s, an American pro-slavery physician looking into the matter of mulattoes. Obviously these are very politically charged, but they're sort of citing, uh, you see this trail of citation and not complained about a host of issues with the mulatto. Um, their shorter lifespans in comparison to whites or blacks, women plagued by physical delicacy and an inability to conceive children. Now it's clear that Knott and Long are writing from very specific historical contexts. 
happening during an era of slavery. They're writing from the perspectives of white men living in societies where slavery is deeply entrenched and race mixing is a very clear and open secret. Um, so it seems to me that their way of constructing the mulatto is very heavily contingent on context. When we start to move into the 20th century, we start to see a change in this notion that mulattoes are going to suddenly be um, extinct. Um, for Davenport, mulattoes were subpar as far as he was concerned, but not because of any kind of inherent infertility or weakness per se. Um, in the heredity of skin color of Negro white crosses, Davenport observed that there was both no support in our data for the notion of a lack of fecundity between Negro white crosses, nor of their deficient viability, end quote. Um, and actually in, you know, talking about this fallacy of um, mulatto infertility, Davenport goes right ahead and just singles out both Edward Long and Josiah Knott saying, these are people who kind of are responsible for this mythology, they are incorrect. But I would say that Davenport adds some nuance to these claims about mulatto weakness. So he says, okay, they don't have sufficient vi viability, um, but there are other problems that Davenport outlines. So at first, in, in a, a, lighter, a, a lecture me, on race crossing, Davenport says that mulattoes inherit some physical robustness from their black parents. He says, quote, the Negro has many advantages in physical quality over the white. He is less apt to suffer from goiter, obesity, deaf mutism, and deafness. The mulattoes show much of these excellent physical qualities, end quote. But I want to be clear that by Davenport sort of um, suggesting that there are some positive elements, that's not him trying to rehabilitate um, mixed race people um, or suggest that they are on the same level as whites. Instead, Davenport is just swapping out one claim for another. So he says um, in this undated lecture um, that uh, mulattoes uh, show an extraordinarily high rate of tuberculosis um, and varial, the venereal disease rate is several times higher um, in them than among the whites. So here, it's not so much that mixed race people are going to go extinct or that they are somehow um, deficient. He actually kind of paints them as vectors of disease, possibly being um, uh, public health menaces. Um, and he's not, again, trying to um, uplift the mulatto, as should be very clear. So what he's doing, I think, is really repackaging um, this old kind of hearsay and relying on his data or his assessment to say, that was incorrect. Here's the real issue with mixed race people in terms of their health. Um, and if you'll notice that reference to um, tuberculosis and venereal disease, um, those are sort of longstanding um, uh, associations with people of African descent. Um, you might think of uh, Frederick Hoffman right, who um, suggests that um, Black people will go extinct, and he mentions high rates of tuberculosis. Um, Hoffman writes in um, 1896, excuse me, um, that's when that's published. Here we're into the 20th century, and Davenport isn't really focused or worried about any kind of extinction. So I would also kind of want to turn our attention to some of the physical characteristics um, that Davenport um, decides to interrogate. Um, what he does in his studies is he actually spends time um, measuring sort of the nose, lips, um, height, shoulders, hair. And so I want to say just a little bit about what Davenport does with these cases. Um, and again, kind of remarking that Davenport is picking up a thread of, of, of thought that comes from slavery era ideas. So we could look back to Edward Long, for example, who spends quite a bit of time detailing the physical features of mulattoes. So Long writes, quote, they seem to partake more of the white than the black. Their hair has a natural curl. In some cases, it resembles the Negro fleece, but in general, it is of a tolerable length, end quote. Now, you might say, okay, that seems like a trivial characteristic. Um, that's something that, you know, maybe that's Long paying attention to minutia. But what you'll actually find um, is that Davenport and did not really think that that was trivial at all. He, he spent some, quite some time actually talking about um, mulatto hair. Um, so we can think about um, family pedigree analyses that he conducts um, in his 1913 study. He notes the color, the length, and the texture of mixed race hair. Um, and indeed in the eugenics record office or the ERO uh, founded by Davenport in 1910 actually has data collected from families like family trees and pedigrees 
but it also has human hair specimens. Um, so this is an image um, of hair specimens uh, that came from a McDonough family. Uh, this is the family that lived in Jamaica. They were um, a mulatto family of the envelopes, um, say a uh, Negro white cross. And there are hair samples here um, from the mother, mother, the father, um, their daughters and two other family members, members. I have to say as a researcher, I'm still trying to figure out how or, or why these hair samples, um, which were actually sent from Jamaica, like made their way to the ERO. If, if the McDonough family wanted to send this information, it's still um, not necessarily clear to me. But Davenport certainly had this data. Um, and so I will say that in his 1913 um, publication, he discusses sort of the, the different kinds of traits and, and hair and what to expect. Um, and so he writes, quote, in how far is the absence or presence of Negro skin pigment associated with the absence or presence of other Negro characteristics? There are two traits that are associated with dark pigmentation of the skin in the Negro, which we can trace to the association and offspring of hybrids, namely color of the hair and form of the hair, degree of curving and point. And so Davenport would make assumptions or a, sort of associate black skin and so-called quote, woolly hair as being so-called Negro traits but he seems to think that this is actually just accidental. Um, he actually describes subjects, for example, as of having, quote, typical Negro features, flat nose, thick lips, woolly, kinky hair. So he sort of understands what a so-called Negro trait is and sees a certain kind of hair texture as being a so-called Negro trait, but he doesn't necessarily think that dark skin and very curly, curly, kinky hair necessarily go together all the time. Now, I do want to just kind of add a little bit of a sort of more context is that Davenport is not um, alone in, in collecting um, hair. Uh, Carolyn Bondé, who I mentioned earlier, also collects hair samples um, from the mixed race fat families that she studies. So this is, seems to be quite a convention of sort of collecting data, including physical specimens from mixed race people. So I want to focus our attention to other data that Davenport collects on mixed people. So we've kind of looked at notions of their vitality or fecundity. We've talked a little bit about physical features. And I want to talk a little bit um, about intelligence. Now, Davenport uh, was very interested in this idea of intermediate intelligence between whites and blacks. Um, Davenport seemed very determined to over overturn any idea that mulattoes were somehow um, slightly in the middle or smarter than Blacks in sort of a positive way. Um, and that is, again, a belief that emerges from the era of slavery. Um, if we look at an 1852 publication on agriculture from the South, we'll find this belief really deeply um, embedded. So here's just the quotation. Um, it appears at all events certain that the mixed race exhibits powers more susceptible to cultivation than the pure African. They are selected at the South for the performance of duties requiring high capacities and are possessed by the mere field Negro. And at the North, every day's observation shows the mulatto is endowed with mental gifts superior to his black brother, end quote. So the idea that there's um, a, a mulatto is more intelligent than um, a darker skinned um, Negro is, is something that's quite common um, in the era of slavery. It's common in the United States. I would actually also add that it's actually quite common um, outside of the United States. So if we look to um, the West Indies, to the British West Indies, there is ample data to suggest that planters and estate managers tended to have a higher opinion of mulattoes or mixed race um, uh, enslaved people. And, and I would also say that this notion, as I mentioned, comes uh, from the era of slavery, but it still lingers into the 20th century. So we could think about the work of um, E.B. Reuter, who is a University of Chicago trained sociologist, who publishes an article uh, called the, Superior the Superiority of the Mulatto in 1917. And he actually says, quote, in all times in the history of the American Negro and in all fields of human effort in which the Negroes have entered, the successful individuals with very few exceptions have been mulattoes, end quote. So this idea really, um, it, it has longevity. But again, Davenport is not convinced of this. And in fact, um, in his uh, race crossing um, in Jamaica study, he goes out of his way to, to prove that mixed race people are not more intelligent 
What he says is that mixed race people are actually prone to having individuals of unusually low intelligence in their group in relation to whites and blacks. So he sums up uh, the performance of mixed race people on mental tests um, in a 1929 lecture that's associated with race crossing in Jamaica. He writes, quote, the whites scored higher than the blacks while the browns, sort of mixed race people, secured an intermediate score. But a study of the distribution of grades showed in many cases this remarkable fact that about 5% of the browns received lower scores than any of the blacks or whites. In the different tests, it's not always the same individual who thus scores extraordinarily low. Thus, the result is not due merely to the chance inclusion amongst the browns of some individuals of low intelligence. Rather, amongst the various browns are some individuals who find themselves quite unable to even make a beginning at certain mental tests. There are fewer full-blooded blacks who show such complete incapacity. It seems reasonable to ascribe this idiosyncrasy of the Browns to their hybrid nature, end quote. So uh, Davenport is referencing for those mental tests um, what was called at the time the Knox Moron test or the Knox Imitation Cube test and Army Alpha tests. And so what Davenport is doing here is taking hard data that he collects and not slavery era hearsay, not listening to what is sort of widely circulating and saying, I have done the data collection, I have proof that um, mixed race people, mulattoes, are not of intermediate intelligence. They're, and they're actually kind of much worse. So this is sort of what I mean when I say Davenport is interested in debunking or sort of following up some of these um, slavery era claims. So I just want to conclude um, with just a few remarks about sort of what this all means in terms of linking eugenics, um, uh, race crossing, and slavery. So what I would say is that this idea of identifying specific characteristics in groups of people and then comparing them to other groups for the purposes of understanding resilience or, or weakness was clearly something shared um, both in the era of slavery and the era of eugenics. Um, eugenicists invested um, time into making legible the strengths and weaknesses of different types of people via their traits. Um, and I would say that one of the lasting consequences of slavery was this idea of blackness being a legible physiological and phenotypic trait that eugenicists actually seized upon. So in the era of slavery, one might see blackness as something that was positive for performing strenuous labor in, in inhospitable climates. But when uh, slavery ends, this trait is no longer desirable, and blackness seems to be uh, morphed into this sign of arrested intellectual development, childlike behavior, um, and a lack of an ability for self-government. Davenport sort of seizes on this logic of, of blackness being a problem, of being a problematic trait in his assessment of um, mixed race people. And so what I would say is that Davenport's race crossing studies um, share with slavery era discourse a desire to objectify and in some way kind of pathologize or otherize black people's bodies by, by harping on these, um, these peculiarities or traits. And it shouldn't really come as a surprise to us, I guess, that he chooses to do this with, with mulatto bodies, right? With bodies that have this, this black trait, this black ancestry. So what I find here is that Davenport is really just refining and repackaging uh, white supremacist ideas about the inferiority of black people by focusing on disharmonious crosses or disharmonious results that occurred when black and white people reproduced together. So in some cases, he may have corrected uh, misperceptions about mulattoes, but that was not out of a desire to right past wrongs. Rather, Davenport transformed the mulatto from an allegedly barren accident of nature into a dangerous and mentally inferior hybrid. Thank you.